John 6, 44. No one can come to me, no one can come to Jesus, unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Okay? And that's why I asked you the question, what is it that draws you to Christianity? No one can come to Jesus unless the Father who sent me draws him. Okay, we were talking about mankind, right? And we're talking about you. Something along the way, if you're a Christian, something caused your heart to say, ah, yeah, I want to be a Christian. Yes, I do want God. Yes, I do love Jesus. Yes, I do want to obey and follow his commands. Something happened to you. And that something is God. That something is God drawing you towards him. This word draw, it means to be like, like pulled in, right? It means to be persuaded. Something persuaded you to say, I don't want to live in my sin anymore. I repent. I turn from all that. Hey, man. Something changed you. And that something is God's irresistible grace. It was God. In that moment in time, when you said, I, I repent of my sins. God, I believe you. I trust in you. Please save me from my sins. In that moment, God overcame your resistance. He said, I... I'm I'm done with with this. I'm done with your sin. Now you're going to believe in me. And at that moment, God overcame you, overcame your resistant heart, and that's when you were like, like saved. In our in our thinking, right? That's when we were saved. Of course, you were saved before the foundation of the world. But in in purposes of our time, that's when you were saved. God drew you to Him. He persuaded you to Him. This is very like kind of like you have to think outside of your own head here, right? You have to think like, oh. God did that for me. It wasn't me, right? I'm dead in my sins, but God did that. God persuaded me. And you have to think, it wasn't because I liked watched a movie. It wasn't because um, my parents just kind of tricked me into becoming a Christian, but it was because God did it to you. God changed your heart. Maybe you've never felt that before. And that, that might be okay. That might be okay, all right? Because some people, they don't have a moment in time. But they, they can't recall when they believed. Like, I, I, I believed in God when I was around four years old, right? Or that's what I think, right? But at the end of the day, who cares? The fact that I believe in God right now and that my heart loves God right now, that's what matters the most. It's not necessarily like the date in time and that you signed a card or that it's engraved in history. No. The fact that you believe in God right now is proof that God overcame your resistance and you want to love him. No one can come to God unless it's God who draws people to him. Nobody can come to God. Let me show you this, okay? We're going to go through a couple verses that are going to explain this word drawn a little bit more. Thanks. This is a cross-reference, okay? So we're going to go through a couple cross-references to prove the point and to elaborate it on a little bit more. John 6.65, okay, cross-reference for the word drawn. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me, Jesus talking here, no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. Granted, as if God would say, okay, sure, I grant you a heart that loves me. Okay, sure, I, I grant that for you. You, you, want, you want that? Sure, I, I grant it to you, I give it to you. Um, it's not even like that sense where like, Oh, oh, God, I want this. Please change my heart. No, God, God just automatically gives it to you. He grants it to you. Given, right? Persuaded. Granted, unless it's granted to him by the Father. So let, just think about that, okay? Think about that. Let, let me give you another verse that might help you a little bit more. Here, given. John three twenty seven. John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. Now, this is John talking, right? This isn't Jesus talking. But the word, when you do the word study, is the same. Given is the same word that was used before in drawn, in drawn, okay? So when you say that God draws people to him, you have these two words, given and granted. It's been given to you. It's been granted to you to have this heart that loves Jesus, okay? It's not even like God working in your heart over time. He does do that. But in in these instances, it's more like, okay, sure, I give it to you. I grant it to you. I'm going to draw you to me. And there's nothing you can do to, to like resist that. It's irresistible. Uh, and again, here's the verse. Okay, 
John 12, 32. John 12, 32. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. So this is Jesus talking, and he uses the same word, draw. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And this, I want to spend some time on this today. When Jesus is saying this, the context is that he's talking about being lifted up from the earth. Two meanings to that. First meaning is that when Jesus is lifted up in glory, ascending to heaven, everybody's going to see Jesus in his glory. Yeah, that will be a moment where, where people come and worship God for sure. But more immediately, and in Jesus' mind, if you look at the context, he's talking about being lifted up from earth on the cross. Okay, he's kind of using this kind of symbolic language. He's kind of speaking like code right here. Okay, kind of like an insider knowledge kind of thing, kind of like an like a inside joke. Not a joke, but you know, inside like to his disciples. When I'm lifted up from the earth, I'm going to draw people to myself. And he's talking about being lifted up on the cross. And this I want to talk about because... I don't think, at least I don't, I don't dwell on the fact that we are drawn to a savior, to a person who has been crucified. It's ridiculous, okay? At the heart of Christianity is the fact that we believe Jesus Christ, this man who lived on earth, who claims to be the son of God, right? He claims to be God himself. He died on the cross, and we believe that he came back to life again. That's nuts. It's bonkers. Okay? Nobody does that. Okay? You walk up on the street and say, yeah, I believe that that guy died and I came back to life again. It's crazy talk. It's crazy talk. I worked, I worked at a hospital, right? I worked in, in, in ICU. And when you're doing CPR, and if they're dead, they're dead. They're not coming back. It doesn't matter how much chest compressions you do. Okay? They're gone. They're gone. And you know it, right? You're over here doing the compressions, and you're like, man, this guy is not coming back. There's nothing there. I could keep doing this all day, and you can circulate his blood, and you can kind of like look at the brain waves. He's not there. He's not there. It's sad, right? It's sad. But for Christians, for Christians, Christians believe that Jesus Christ was dead. That guy died on the cross, and we believe that he came back to life again. And what draws us to that, right? Why are we so enamored with Jesus Christ, this man who died on the cross? It's because you see his beauty, right? It's because you see that he is God. Something inside your heart draws you to that ugliness, that grotesqueness, that ridiculousness of the fact that Jesus really is God. You really believe it, and you really do believe that he came back to life again. That is God overcoming hearts that are hardened to things of God, right? That's God saying that like, hey, I know this is crazy. I know this sounds ridiculous, but I'm going to draw you to it and you will not be able to resist looking at Jesus Christ on the cross and saying, man, that is God. He is beautiful. I want to follow him and dedicate my life to him. Something does that in your heart and it's God. Okay? This is, this is where I want us to go. Okay, the word of the cross, right? The word of the cross. Famous verse, 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 25. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, right? This is foolishness to some people. People think Christians are dumb and stupid and idiots. Um, it's folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, if you be- really believe this, it's the power of God, Right? There's power in the gospel. There's power in this message of Jesus forgiving our sins, dying on the cross, and coming back to life again. For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach, the message of the gospel, to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Okay? So there's this, this thought right behind this, that even Paul himself, Paul himself knows that, yeah, this is, this is really foolish for us as Christians to believe that there's some sort of power behind Jesus and the cross, and to think that he really is God. But if you really do know this, you know 
there's power behind it. You know it has the power to change people's lives. And the rest of the world, they don't get it. But to Christians, it's power. You know that. So uh, for, for our, our kind of like devotional exercise today, okay, I want you to think about the foolishness of the cross. Kind of step back for a moment. Pretend you weren't a Christian. Think about how ridiculous it sounds that some guy died on the cross, and yeah, I think he's the son of God, and I, I do think he came back to life again. Right? Think about how crazy that sounds. And I, think, I want you to think about what that means for people who preach and who teach and for even for you as you share about your life, as you talk about God and the gospel. Think about how, how foolish and ridiculous it sounds when you say, yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian. I believe that the Bible is God's word, that God wrote it, and he used human people to write it, and it's infallible, and it's how I want to base my life upon. Like, yeah, that dictates everything that I do in my life. That's going to dictate my career. That's going to dictate my future. Yeah, I, I put my my life stake in God's word. Right? That sounds that sounds crazy. It sounds nuts. And I want you to now, okay, now that we've kind of thought about that, I want you to think about this. These are theological terms, okay? There's an outward call or a general call that people make, okay? And that's done through like preaching or through generic sharing of the gospel when you ask your friends, right? But there's an inward call. There's a specific call, an effectual call that God works inside of people's hearts, right? So I can be up here and I can be talking and that's like a general call, a general knowledge, a general uh, talk to be saved. But God, God's the one that talks into your heart to really make the change. It's not me that persuades you, but it's God working in your heart. And that's effectual. When God does it, there's no resisting. Okay, so this is, this is it. Um, this is our, our kind of like our point for today. Irresistible grace, the grace of God overcomes hard hearts. Okay, that's, that's all this point is. And again, like I said, it's kind of repetitive of what we learned from before about unconditional election, God choosing people. Um, but this is how he does it. He overcomes it. The new birth is monergistic regeneration. Okay, those are theological terms. What it means is that it's one-sided. Monergistic means that it's all God. It's, it's not done by us. It's all God. There's no like interaction coming through. There's no transaction taking place. It's God just saying, boom, you're going to believe. That's it. Regeneration meaning that your heart is renewed to love God and to, to love his word. That's what it means, to be regenerated. Okay. Um, the Holy Spirit never fails to bring his own to faith. Okay, there's no point where the Holy Spirit is like, oh, I want this person to believe, but he's not going to, oh, okay, forget it then. No, no. What the Holy Spirit, what God wants, he gets. That's what it means. And next, God overcomes our resistance as he wills, right? It's like easy for him. In the Old Testament, we talk about God changing the heart of Pharaoh, hardening in it, softening it. God uses people's hearts like putty, right? It's like clay. God shapes and molds it as he wishes. Same thing for you and me. He changes our hearts as he wills. And then finally, God works within the sinner to make us willing to come to Christ. Again, there's a part in time, there's a point in time where you say, no, I'm not willing. And then eventually, somewhere in time, you said, yes, I am willing to come. That's because God changed your heart to do it. Yes, crucifixion is real. Yes, we believe that Jesus died on the cross. And we believe that he came back to life again. And it's ridiculous. It sounds silly. It sounds crazy. But if God has drawn you to him, then you don't see it as silly or crazy, but you see it as loving and you see it as merciful. Um, the reason why I feel that I'm drawn to Christianity um, is because somewhere along the way, I see Jesus as being beautiful. And I believe that he's the son of God. So there's something about Jesus that makes me want to love him. And I think that comes from seeing his word. I think that comes from seeing Christ reflected in the church. And I, I think that comes from seeing what God is doing in the world. Um, there's evidence of God, but the biggest evidence that we have is that he changes people's hearts. And I think Jesus, God, Holy Spirit drawing us to him, drawing people to him, that's 
evident enough for me, and it persuades me too. Um, it's a work of God. It's not a work of my own heart. But at the end of the day, we can all be thankful for God's irresistible grace and how he overcomes our hardened hearts.